this inspired insider.com interview we talk with sam cawthorne ceo founder of empowering enterprises what do you do when you're told that you're never going to walk again and life is never going to be the same listen to what happened with sam and how he also put the prime minister into therapy that and much more Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like Sam and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. We're going to talk about how do we overcome personal and business challenges. For Sam, he was told he would never walk again, play the guitar again, and he was told his life would never be the same. Sam's the CEO of Empowering Enterprises. He speaks all over the world to companies such as Google, Exxon, BP, and many more. He's been featured in the USA Today, New York Times, and his book, Bounce Forward, which we should all check out, How to Transform Crisis into Success, reached number five on the bestseller list. Sam, thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you, and I always like to include a fun fact. And fun fact about you is you put the prime minister into therapy. Tell us what happened. Yeah, so it was the Prime Minister of Australia, so you probably already noticed that I'm from Australia from my accent. But so I won this award, it was the Young Australian of the Year, so it was one of the highest honours of any Australian. And so here I am in Canberra, the capital of Australia, on Australia Day, 26th of January. And so I had the opportunity to go, to go to the Prime Minister's house there at the Lodge in Canberra on Australia Day. But I'm thinking to myself, what can I do in order for the Prime Minister of Australia to remember me? Because as you guys know, you know, PMs probably meet hundreds of people every day as if they remember everyone that they meet. And so here I am, I put on my best suit, I went down the hotel lobby. Now you need to realize I've, a, I've actually got a prosthetic arm, so I've got a bionic arm actually. Um, the, it, it is the most advanced bionic arm in the world right now. It is the only one in the Southern Hemisphere. It's worth over $120,000. Now get this, I program it with my iPhone 5. Wow. I've got an app for my arm, which is really cool. But on this particular day, I had my other arm on. Now, I have seven arms all up, which is really cool. But on this particular day, I had my other arm on. And so I decided to play a practical joke to the Prime Minister of Australia just so he would remember me. So imagine this. I walked up to the Prime Minister of Australia. He didn't notice at all that I had a prosthetic arm. So as he went to shake my hand, I detached my hand and my hand came off into his hand. And it made, you know, made world news, you know, the young Australian of the year providing an armless prank to the Prime Minister. And in his Australia Day speech, the Prime Minister of Australia, he said, he looked over to me and he goes, and thanks, Sam, I'm still recovering from therapy today. <laughs> so what are you wearing now? Uh, actually, at the moment, I don't have an arm. I, 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 I've just, um, my, my arm is currently um, at, at the doctor's, actually. So at the prosthesis, it's, it's just getting repaired. There's just a few little tweaks that need to be done to it. But, uh, but yeah, I, I like some, yeah, I've got a guitar arm. You know, as you said in the intro, the doctor said I'll never be able to play the guitar. I am one of the only people in the world that plays the guitar with an above elbow amputation on my right arm. Uh, I, I've got a swimming arm, so it's like a little flipper huh. that fits on the end of my stump. Um, I've got a hook arm. Yeah, as, as I was saying, I've got seven arms. Actually, how many do you have? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have to program? When you program on your iPhone, what do you, pro what do you have to program? So I can program various um, various movements with my hand. Mm -hmm. So say, for instance, if I'm doing one particular movement just to go and grab something or whatever it might be, I can then just I can then just move a couple of my nerve endings, and suddenly it'll do that entire movement all in one flow. Mm -hmm. So you you know you can program various things. I can also program my hand to do the bird, which is great. <laughs> I wouldn't that have guessed that one. That, that one you seem like too nice of a guy to to program. Yeah. That <laughs> It's fun. So Sam, we'll talk about what happened with the catastrophic event. But before you kind of go into that, what was life like before? So before my accident, uh, so I was born and raised down on a family farm down in Tasmania. 
Yes, you heard me right. It was down where they had the Tasmanian devil. My mum is Indian, my father is Scottish, and there, was, there were 11 people in my family, seven boys, um, four girls. Actually, I'm an uncle 33 times as well. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. So then I married my high school sweetheart, um, and then I was in the prime of my life. You know, I was um, I had the great job. So I was working for the Australian federal government as a youth futurist. I did a lot of extracurricular activities. So I was being classically trained as a singer. Did a lot of theatre stuff as a professional dance teacher, and um, so I had a full time job with the federal government as a youth futurist. All these extracurricular activities, but also as well as a family. I had my two older girls. I uh, had a mortgage in the house. Twenty six years old from my life and that's when I had a, um, a large uh, vehicle accident. So I'm going to have you tell people for, you know, for people who don't know what happened, but first, what in your childhood, obviously growing up with 11 kids, what, what do you think back to that influenced you? What do you remember most from your childhood that has such a positive impact on you? So, so my parents were very, very strict, um, and also they were quite religious as well, so very sort of Christianity religious. And so at the time, I hated it. I hated living under a dictatorship, um, you know, and, and my parents were very, very strict. And, um, and to be quite honest, I think in a way they mentally and emotionally abused us, not physically, but um, just in, in regards to, um, you know, sort of... Uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit hard to explain. Yeah, what's but, an know, example that, maybe where one of you stepped out of line and and how they um, reacted? Okay, so so every morning and every night they made us do a thing which is called singing and praying. So every single morning for the fifteen years that I was at home, we had to sing gospel songs. So we all played the guitar and musical instruments, piano, et cetera, brass instruments. Then we had to read the Bible um, and then and then we prayed. So for an hour in the morning, before school, before anything, and then an hour at night for 15 years of my life. Huh. So I would know the Bible like the back of my hand, you know, like every, um, I, I'd probably read it back to front now seven or eight times. Um, and you know it was quite a quite a quite rigorous you know they, they they ran us like a military operation which was quite interesting um so so not not physically abusive or anything like that my my mum's love languages don't know if you've read the five love languages but you know everyone sort of got their own uh, their own type of love language my mum's love language was acts of service so as long as there's food on the table and a roof over her head that's how she showed her love so my parents never hugged us they never said sam i love you um, and I think that definitely affected most of us when we, when we grew up because every single one of us, bar the youngest in the family, we all left home when we were 15, 16 years old and we all got into bad company really? because we lived such a sheltered life there at home. And then when we left home, we all, we all were influenced in quite, by quite a negative force. So most of us went into drugs, went into alcohol. Most of us, you know, went on the went went on the bad side. But slowly by sl slowly, uh, one by one, most of us have all sort of come back and lived a, a quite a, a decent, um, successful life. Bar a couple of my um, siblings, who there's one guy that's um, currently homeless, and, and I think he was mentally, emotionally abused the most growing up at home. Wow. But uh, I, I know it might sound a bit um, negative towards my parents. Don't get me wrong, I love. Of my parents I think my parents are amazing they're beautiful people they just parented me in a different way to what I would and today they're both alive and I'm very good friends with them. so what bad company did you fall into when you left huh yeah so I left home when I was 15 years old um, got involved in the wrong type of company and they influenced me in quite a negative way and now then I found myself getting kicked out of college because of, well, I wasn't living at home when I was going to college. I found myself getting kicked out of college because I was dealing drugs. And so what I had to do, I had to strategically disconnect myself from a lot of my friends um, to now start hanging out with people now that I do hang out with. One of my chapters in my book is called Proximity is Power. And we've all heard of, you know, the, uh, there's a long line of research now that says that we are the average of our five closest friends, the company that we keep determine who we are. And that's exactly the same with our bank account balance, with our energy levels, with our mm. focus levels, with our weight, with our, you know, our, our happiness, the whole lot that we are the average of our five closest friends. So I was hanging around with these people that influenced me in a very toxic way. It was a toxic proximity. So I had to disconnect myself from these guys.
So how did you pull yourself out of that? Because someone may be watching this and may not have been as bad as you know drugs or alcohol, but they want to do something greater. How did you detach yourself from that? It's not easy to um, do. Yeah, look, to be quite honest, it was a girl. <laughs> ah, I knew a girl was involved. <laughs> It, it was a girl and um, and she went to the same college as me and I really liked her um, mm -hmm. and she could see that I was heading around down this spiral path and she she saw that I got kicked out of, out of school and she saw that I was hanging around with these people that influenced me in a very negative way. And so she go, gave me an ultimatum. She said, Sam, it's either me or your mates. Hmm. And you know what I, who I chose? I chose my mates. Really? Initially. Yes, I did. And I realized after a couple of months that it was the wrong choice. And so I then said, I then went groveling back to this girl, Kate. And I said, Kate, I'm sorry. I, I now want to, you know, I'm going to disconnect myself from all my friends. I've, I've found out now that they were a very negative proximity and I want to start hanging out with you. So I had to do a lot of sucking and a lot of, you know, <laughs> sort of, uh, um, but today this girl, Kate and me, we are happily married of 15 wow. years. That's amazing. Yeah. So good thing you changed your mind on that. Very, very. One of the best decisions I've made in my life, mate. So tell us about what happened on that day, on the dreadful day. So as I was saying, prime of my life, 26 years old, had the mortgage, had the job, had the two kids, and obviously me and my wife, Kate. And it was my fault. Um, I was driving along. Uh, I fell asleep at the wheel, oh. uh, veered over the other side of the road, and I had a 206-kilometer head-on collision with a semi-trailer truck. Wow. So that's about 160 mile thereabouts plus. Um, so as I was saying, it was my fault. I fell asleep and I veered over the other side of the road. Um, I was pronounced dead at the scene by the paramedics, and my heart stopped for a bit over three minutes. I was then on life support for an entire week, I was then in hospital for five months and then in a wheelchair for a year. Doctor said, I'll never be able to wait, uh, you know, never be able to walk ever again. You'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. Um, so it was a very, very extraordinary journey and navigating through that, both in my own psychology, but also being a father, also being a husband. And suddenly, you know, here I am, I was fit, able-bodied, very healthy, did all this sexual group activities. And suddenly, here I am, lame in a bed with only one arm, saying that, Sam, you know, you won't be able to walk ever again. And my injuries were quite significant. I had six broken ribs, lacerated, a punctured kidney. Both of my lungs had collapsed. I had my right arm amputated above the elbow. I broke my hip, lost my entire quad on the road on my right side. Lost my kneecap, broke my fibula, broke my ankle, um, broke the femur. Yeah, so it was quite a significant um, both internal and external injuries. I remember, you know, listening to you talk about this and I think or reading about it and they resuscitated you about three times. Do you remember anything from when that happened or was it all just waking up in the hospital? Yeah, so I, initially I didn't remember at all, but then I had a thing which is called flashbacks. So I started having these flashbacks and it started reminding me about certain things that had happened. And it was quite a unique experience, like experiencing flashbacks and, and remembering certain aspects of that entire, uh, you know, sort of sequence of events. And so initially, no, I didn't remember it. But yeah, I, I remember the noise of the impact. I remember waking up. I remember fighting for my life. I remember all my rescuers that were there that were t telling me just to breathe, just to hold on. Um, so yeah, it was quite a um, quite a traumatic experience. So what what do you think kept you from giving up? What do you think kept you from giving up at that point? Um, so I, I think it was two things. Um, definitely a faith. I have a very very strong faith, and that has really helped me. You know, obviously have the right type of mindset and psychology to overcome. But also, I think my proximity as well is my kids and my wife. Um, my kids. Uh, amazing, and I was really worried about my little child. You know how they're going to react. Here's their father that was throwing her up, throwing them up in the air with both arms, or running with skipping, and suddenly here I am, lame in a bed with only one arm. And I remember my little girl coming into the hospital for the very first time, and I was lying in my bed, and out of the corner of my ear, I heard her down the end of the hospital hallway. So I sat up in my bed, and my eyes started to well up, not knowing how she was going to react not knowing how she's going to accept daddy for what had happened, how she's going to adapt to this change. 
and I'm staring at the door, hospital door, just waiting for her to come in. And suddenly I remember seeing these two tiny little hands and she grabbed hold of the door, right? And then she peered in and her eyes just met and she ran into the hospital room. Tears are running down my face yeah. and she jumped up in the bed and she goes, Daddy, 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 did you have a car accident? And I said, yeah, I had a car accident. And she goes, Daddy, 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 did you lose your arm in the accident? And I said, yeah, I lost it. I lost it. I lost my arm. And then she goes, and Daddy, Daddy, the doctors, they couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> so she literally thought they just had to find my arm and stick it tape it back on. You know, she's a, um, you know, I, I would do anything for my kids and they're amazing. What was the hardest part about rehabbing? Obviously, right now you proved all the doctors wrong. You, you play the guitar, you walk. What was, I mean, it wasn't that easy. What was the, some of the hardest parts about it? Um, I think, uh, I think particularly also when the doctors were saying, hey, Sam, you know, you will never be able to walk ever again. It was probably more my own psychology and fighting with my own demons. And, you know, when, when doctors are saying that you can't do this, you know, how, how, how possible is it? You know, is it, is it impossible? So I, I suppose I was doubting my doubts. And I think that's a very powerful lesson I think we can all learn when people say that you can never do something. Or if, yeah, you, you know when someone says that? You know when someone says, you know, you'll never be able to achieve that, you won't be able to do that, you might as well give up, there's no chance you can... There's something deep down within that says, stuff you, I'm going to prove you wrong. And that's exactly how I felt. I, I, th I thought, look, I'm going to prove them wrong. And in a way, it might have been that the challenge of proving them wrong or it might have just simply been not settling for the status quo, yeah. not settling for mediocre or norm. And I had to rise up above that. And it's, it was a very, very extraordinary journey through that and navigating through that and understanding my own psychology and how I worked and, and having this unstoppable resilience that said, no matter what, I'm going to make this happen. Yeah. So on those tough times when you, you know, because someone will see you walking around, they wouldn't hardly know that someone told you you couldn't walk again. What do you think back on? Was it something um, with your faith, your kids, all the above? How do you get through? Because you had to do tons of rehab for, the, for everything, didn't you? Yeah, I think in order for me to continue to maintain that, that level of psychology, I think it was also a, a thing which we've all heard of before, and it's so cliche, but just simply being grateful. I mean, I, I could no longer be here today. My kids right now could be growing up without a father. My wife would be a widow. Um, or the best case scenario, maybe I could be still here, but I'd be in completely jelly. So I'd be a burden to my family, to my kids. And so in a way, I've now programmed and conditioned myself to be grateful. It's simple as that. Be grateful. On the, uh, 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 and even on the little things like the food on the table, the roof over our head, yeah. the clothes on our back. And so, I, so the moment people say, hey, Sam, you must have a down day. You must feel, you know, yeah. and how do you get, how do you navigate through that? For me, I've never had a down day. I've never had a down day. I've never suffered from depression or bitterness or anger or anything at all like that. It's because now I've conditioned, I've programmed myself to realize how grateful I am. So the moment that I might feel down or depressed or bitter or the moment that I might feel, you know, like as if I'm having a down, I would, I, I've now conditioned myself that suddenly I think, wait, I am grateful. Yeah. There are things in my life that I am grateful for. And so, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's a conditioning of our brain that we, that we all have. So who are your mentors through this process? And what was some of the good advice they gave you that you leaned on for them? Uh, so I've, I've got a lot of mentors, that, you know, throughout my life. You know, obviously proximity is power. So I've now sort of got a, a, a health mentor, a business mentor, a, a, um, a, a faith or like a religious or like, you know, um, a godly mentor, if you want to call it. And so, and even my wife and my kids, you know, they, they mentor me all the time. And, and, and even from um, internal mentors or even external mentors, people that I don't have control of, like, I love reading Nelson Mandela's books and his literature. I love reading, you know, sort of Richard Branson and, and, and Steve Jobs and, you know, learning from these guys. But, so I'm always and always consistently and continually looking at ways how I can grow, how I can see progress in my life, because I believe that progress equals happiness. 
so, so, so you go. No, I was going to say, so what does, what do you think back on? What's some of the best advice one of your mentors have given you? Um, one of the first things I heard coming out of um, but it's still being in hospital is someone said, Sam, it is your decision, not your condition that determines who you are. And, you know, I'm thinking about that for a second. You know, it's so true that it is our decision, not our condition. You know how we've all got these conditions on our life? I mean, obviously, my condition is a lot more physical, but we all have these conditions, whether or not it's loneliness or doubt or insecurity, whether or not it's we feel that people don't love us, whether or not it could be financial problems, relationship breakdowns. I, you know, I don't know what type of condition that we're all going through. But one thing I do know that it is our decision, not our condition, that determines who we are. And so that, that really spoke volumes to me and just realizing that no one can ever, ever take away our freedom of choice, our free will, our decision. I mean, we, we, and we all, have, we all have conditions, but it is our decision. So that was, the, that was the most important real estate for me at the time. Yeah. So now today, what's, when you look back, what's been one of the proudest moments that you've been able to accomplish after this event? It was quite interesting. I... Um, me and my wife had a little baby boy about two two years after my accident, and my uh, my surgeon came up to me and he goes to me, "Hey Sam, it's a good thing that something still works." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mate, you know, having a death experience, you really realise what really matters in life. Um, and you know, look, we, we've seen some phenomenal success in our business, and you know, we're making more money than ever. And we've started this amazing charity where we're working with the true poorest of the poor, which are the kids that live with a disability in developing worlds. We've started up these three schools there in there in India, wh where you know we we are working with the true poorest of the poor. Uh, we're feeding over four hundred kids every single day their only meal that they get. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time in my business life, you know, we've, I've released this book, my second book, which it was, and, it and became number, number five in the, in the bestseller. Um, you know, we're, we're doing gigs for Google, for Apple, for ExxonMobil. You know, I've never been more successful in my career. But in saying all that, and yes, it's all very fulfilling and everything like that, but I think one of the greatest things is me still keeping my marriage and being a great father to my kids. And me and my wife have now been together 17 years. And this industry, particularly the self-development industry, it is tough keeping a marriage. It is very tough. I'm on the road all the time. And uh, yet me and my wife have never been more happier. We've now set up guidelines and systems that work for us. Um, you know, I am on the road a lot, as well as also being a great father to my kids. And so for me, that is without a doubt the greatest achievement in my life in my world yeah i mean you bring up a good point there because it doesn't have to be someone traveling but it could be just someone working long hours what kind of systems do you recommend someone to do that you that works for you and your kids and your your family because you're traveling so much have you heard of the three g's the three g's the gold of the girls the glory so the, obviously this is you know for, particularly with people that either live high stressful lives or these you know highly intelligent people whatever but there are three things that we just need to watch our intention of what do we truly focus on so the first one is the gold and you know do we do everything just for a fatter wallet for a nicer car for a second boat for a first grade holiday but do we do things just for the gold second thing is the girls um, and it's, you know, that's whole, you know, immorality, sexual morality that, that we have and making sure that we're just, we're just keeping true to ourself because who would know, like here I am in a different country and I could quite easily be unfaithful, but who would know? I would know. And so for me, you know, just, just really, really watching myself and having a system in place where, you know, where I, I, there's no meetings one-on-one -on -one with a female outside of hours. You know, just little, little things like that, which no one talks about. But for me, it, it, you, know, you know, I want to make sure that I live with integrity. One thing I think in this industry is um, that charisma doesn't always equal character. Let me say that again. Charisma doesn't always equal character. So we can meet those people that have this amazing charisma, larger than life personalities come up to you, they look you in the eye, they shake your hand, they promise you the world, but can they back that up with values, with morals, with integrity, with ethics and so on and so forth. And then the third one is, is the glory, 
is do we do it just for the applause? Do we do it to feed our own egos? Do we do it just so it's all about me? Um, do we do it for the glory? And so there's a three areas, particularly in our intentionality of why we do things. The goal, the girls, the glory. And so this is a system that, I've, that I'm always, always just being conscious about in my own integrity and in my own walk as well, my own business, is making sure that uh, that my intentionality and my values are still staying, you know, strong. Yeah. So why do you do it then? So my overarching vision, my overarching dream is to add value to people's lives in a positive way. So everything has to align with that. So whether or not it's writing a book, speaking on stage, whether or not it's writing a, um, you know, a blog, doing a video, having a webinar with you, I need to make sure that I do everything, um, you know, um, that where it adds value to people's lives in a positive way. I also work via a principle. It's called the 10-10-10 principle. Have you heard of this? Mm-mm. The 10, 10, 10 principle is this. Everything that I focus on, everything that I do has to align within that vision that I just told you. It has to align with that in the next 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years. And if it doesn't, I won't spend any time at all on it. Yeah. So what have you had to turn down because of that? That was maybe a little painful. I don't know. Like Even things like watching TV or playing a game, even things like just things that do not serve me. Mm-hmm. Like even, even mentoring a client. Like, like for instance, if like some things that don't stimulate me is saying the same thing to someone and expecting different results, but the results aren't being different at all. So if I if I mentor someone, if I told if I've given them all the best wisdom and all the best best advice for them to get themselves back on track, mm. and they don't do anything at all about it, and then they come crying back to you for exactly the same things, I'm saying, look, I've already told you, and so that frustrates me a lot so I won't spend any time any time at all on it because it doesn't serve me and it doesn't serve them because they're wasting both each other's time so just little, little things like that that I'm mm-hmm. you know I need to just consciously think does this serve me and the people around me in the next 10 minutes 10, 10 months 10 years and if it doesn't I won't spend any time at all on it yeah and it kind of goes back I ask this as a parent too I'm curious you know from your upbringing what's happened to you now with the incident what are some things you do uh, parenting wise yeah, so we've got some really good systems in place, and particularly with all my travel. So I do about 30, 40 flights a month. Actually, my Holy record cow. My record today is 56 flights in one month. Oh, my God. So that'll give you an idea, obviously, the level and the scope that, uh, that my business is on. So obviously then trying to, you know, be a good father and a husband, you know, I have to have some good systems in place. And so I have a really good Skype relationship with my kids, which is really cool. And my little boy, he hasn't still quite worked out how to use Skype, so he's eating a banana. And he goes, here, Dad, have a taste. Squash. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, look, and the reality is that maybe I'm not at home more often than most other fathers, but get this, I'm actually at home. Which means even though there's fa- fathers out there that are at home, they're not really at home. Whereas when I'm at home, I'm at home. They had 110% of my focus. There's no TV, no distraction. They had all of me. And I think, you know, quality, you know, quality versus quantity. So for me, the time that I spend with my kids and even with my, with my wife, it is quality time. They have 100% of my attention. And me and my wife, you know, try and do a date every single fortnight. Every fortnight, we set out, a, out an evening and we'll have a date night. And it's very, very important to our relationship. I mean, mate, we've been, we're, we're first girlfriend, boyfriend to each other. Um, we've now been together what, longer than what we have been apart, 17, 18 years. Wow. So yeah, it's quite an interesting journey navigating through that and making sure that you have a third space in your world as well. And what a third space is something outside of work and something outside of home, something that you do just do just for you that will align yourself and fill your tank. So I've now set put um, systems in place so I have a third space in my world hmm. um, and that just works really well. So my third space is actually going to the movies. Nice. I love Anywhere at all in the world, I'll go to the movie, sit in the same spot, eat my ice cream, switch off, and be entertained for three hours, for two, for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, whatever it might be. So, I, so even if I've been away for two, three weeks, I come home and my wife sees I'm stressed or whatever, she would hand me my coat and my keys, and she'll say, "Go and watch a movie." So I know, I know, I know that I know that I know what's important in my world and what I need to do. So. Sam, for people out there, what's one thing you tell them to do right now to start to overcome maybe a personal or business challenge that they have? 
Where should I they start? Because, you I mean, we talked about a lot of stuff. Where, where should people start, you think? Okay. So one of the first principles in my book is called Crisis Creates Opportunity. So I actually tell people, escalate it into a crisis. Because when it's a crisis, there's something in our biology that says we must get ourselves out of it. There's a long line of research now that says that crisis can ignite some of the greatest growth periods in our life. The Chinese have a two-syllabus word for the word crisis. It's danger and crucial point or danger and opportunity. Crisis equals opportunity. There's a massive corporate buzzword out there which is sweeping the corporate community and it's called adversarial growth which again means some of the most toughest of adversities that we have can ignite some of the greatest growth periods in our life. So crisis creates opportunity, but just remember what we focus on. If we focus on everything that's going wrong, if we focus on all the crap, all the loneliness, all the frustration, the relationship, financial problems that we might be under, that's how we're going to feel. But if we focus on all the opportunities, everything that's lying in front of us, all the, all the, you know, all the dreams, aspirations, if we, what we focus on is what we get. I have a thing which is called phantom pain. So if I close my eyes, I can still feel in my arm, every single one of my fingers, I can feel my wrist and my elbow as if it's all still there, but it's not. It's called phantom pain. Sometimes it'll wake me up in the middle of the night because it's so painful. It's like the worst pins and needles that you've ever had in your entire life. Mm. Times that by 100, that's how my arm feels 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But it's a thing which is called cognitive disassociation, which means now I've conditioned myself to no longer focus on this. Get this, if I injure myself on this side of my body, I then just focus on my arm, suddenly this pain here will go. Hmm. It's part of neurological conditioning. So what we focus on is what we get. If you focus on everything that's going wrong, that's how you're going to feel. If you focus on all the opportunities that derive from a crisis moment, that's where you're going to head. Yeah. And so my biggest biggest advice is, you know, that, is that realize that crisis creates opportunity. Second one is proximity is power. I've already spoken about this. It's all about that you are the average of your five closest friends. Hang out with people that inspire you, that bring you up, not bring you down. So it's very, very important to hang out with the right type of proximity. And then the third, one more point as well, is this whole thing about leveraging happiness that fuels success. So purposefully be happy, bottom line. Happiness is a choice. It is a choice first. So you choose to be happy. It is a conscious choice and a decision that you make in everything that you do, whether or not you're happy or whether or not you're not. But just choose to be happy. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. I love it. Sam, last question. Just tell us a little bit more about your business. What are you most excited about now and where can people find you? Um, so pe people can find me on my website, samcawthorn.com. If you haven't got a copy of my book, you must get a copy of my book. You can get it from my website or any good book retailer online, etc. I can sign it for you if you buy it from my, my website. But I'm really, really excited about where my book is going to be taking me. I'm currently on my, working on my second book, which I'm really, sorry, my third book, should I say, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, but yeah, mate, I'm, I'm stimulated every moment of every day as long as I'm adding value and contributing. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, but the top level of that is on contribution that we feel the most fulfilled when we are adding value to people's lives. And so find a way where you can add value to someone else's life. If you're feeling like crap, if you're having a down day, you go and help someone else to be happy, guarantee you'll feel more happy than them. I'll finish off with this. Whenever me and my wife and my kids go through drive through McDonald's, we always buy the meal of the car behind us. Hmm. Seriously, that's what we do. So imagine that, right? Here we are going up to the window. We pay for our meal. Then we pay for the car behind us. And the lady's like, oh, my gosh, that's awesome. And then we drive forward. But then me and my wife and my kids, we all look behind us and watch this car driving up to the window. They go for pay for the meal. And the lady's like... In the car in front of you, just pay for the meal. That's awesome. And these people in this car are like, oh, and we're an outcome. We're going, yes. But just for that moment, we're adding happiness and positivity in the lady there in McDonald's, the car behind us. But you know who the most happiest are? Is we are in our car. Because we are contributing, we're adding value. Altruism ignites high performance. The act of giving, the act of generosity. So always look at ways how you can be generous. Um, and that's obviously what we're doing with our charity. If you're interested at all with, that, with the charity that we're doing, so we create, we create these green sustainable schools in India. 
Um, they're completely all made out of renewable, sustainable products. And the education that we're educating these kids is not only the core subjects like maths, English, music, art, sciences, but also teaching them horticulture, agriculture, eco-sustainability, so on and so forth. So it's a brilliant um, system that we've got there. And that charity is called caringforpeople.org. That was caringforpeople.org. I'll link that up too. I love that story. Now a bunch of people are going to be paying for other people's meals. <laughs> I love it. But Sam, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and uh, good luck on all your journeys. Thank you. Everyone thank you should check out much. samcawthorne.com. Thank you very much.